All right, guys. So um, I'm I'm pretty sure uh, I'm pretty sure everybody who's here is here. So let's talk more about inverse functions. And graphing. Okay, so um, <clears throat> we've talked about how to calculate an inverse function. Um, I, you know, tried to convince you that we need the function to be one to one in order to invert it, right? Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit more about, um, you know, if you're given the graph of a function, what does the graph of the inverse function look like, all right? So let me just lay some things down here. If we have f is a mapping from the domain of f over to the range of f, right? And if this is, if this is a one-to-one -one function, then we can write f inverse is a mapping from, well, it, it maps from the range of f back to the domain of f. In other words, the domain of the inverse function is equal to the range of the function and vice versa. The range of the inverse function is equal to the domain of the function. Um, and then, of course, the other thing is, what is an inverse function? It's one that when you compose the inverse function with the function, you get back where you started, right? It, it undoes the action of the function. So um, graphing, graphing. So let's talk about graphing here. So basically the result is this. If x comma y is in the graph of the function, all right, then y comma x is in the graph of the inverse function. How did we define the how did we define the graph of, of the function? What was it? It was a set of ordered pairs such that x is in the domain, right? And y is equal to what? The key point here is y equals to what? f of x, right? <clears throat> so over here, if we had something in the graph of the inverse function, what would we have? We'd have um, y equals to f inverse of x, right? That would it mean that would mean that would be what it means to be in the graph of the inverse function. Right? But the thing is, this has very pointy corners. If you hit this the wrong way, you could seriously like just open your arm up. That would end class. Especially if I hit an artery. I don't know. Although you guys I don't, I don't know enough anatomy. That would probably end the semester. You guys, would, you guys would tie me off, right? Somebody put a tourniquet on me, right? <laughs> um, I, should, I should put it in my will that if, if I was to you know, suddenly die, then my wife should have to finish teaching. And then I could tell you about how hard a, a greater my wife was. And then, then you'd be in your interest to like, save me, you know? Like, I let my wife grade calculus once, like about 15 years ago to start. It was the first time I taught calculus, maybe. No, it wasn't the first time. It was, I was a couple years after I've been teaching calculus. But for some reason, I had too much. I had like 40 students. I had like 80 tests, and I just needed help. So she, she graded along with me. She has a master's in math. She knows calculus, you know. Um, and then get through a section. I get through a section. I calculate the average. And then I calculate the average of her test, and like, what? What happened? Like, I, I have, I have like seventy percent, and she's got like fifty-five percent. 
how, how did this happen? And then I realized that my wife is a very difficult grader. And so then I had to like reel her back in and, and, and explain to her partial credit. And, I, and, and it took me a while, but I trained her to be nicer. But if I was dead, there'd be nothing stopping her. So <laughs> you should, well, you know. But it would, you would still be here, though. And, and, if it's, and I'm going to write my will so that she grades the class if I, you know. She, she has better things to do than to watch my YouTube channel. Let's see here. So f of y um, equals to f. F and <laughs> Rudy's a what? It's a character. <laughs> yes. Well, that that's. Yeah, I mean, we we need more characters. Anyway, um. So my, my point is, if y equals f inverse of x, then the, the key property of the function as it relates to the inverse is that like, if you compose an equation that's written in terms of the function with the inverse function, they, the function and the inverse function basically cancel out, and vice versa. If you've got like the inverse function equals to something, if you want to get rid of the inverse function, just let the function act on the equation. See, if I take f of y, it's equal to f of f inverse of x. But if you go back to the definition of inverse function, these essentially cancel, and you're just left with x again, right? Oh man. So x is equal to f of y, right? And if you think about that, that means that the role of x and y is flipped around for the inverse function, right? So that's how we can create the graph of the inverse function from the given graph of the function. So it's a problem in your homework like this, where I don't give you a formula. I just, you know, tell you something like, here, let's actually put this into practice. Um, let's see here. Here's like minus 3, minus 3. I'll go over here to, let's say, something like this. Should be roughly speaking 3 minus 2. And then, let's see here. That would be something like uh, 3, 6, I think, up there. Oh, I can't do that. I was about to say, graph this function. What's the problem with that? <laughs> if I told you, look at the graph of this function. Do you see any, uh, see any problems with that, maybe? Actually, if this, was, if this was 3, 6, it'd be like vertical, wouldn't it? Can I, is that the graph of a function? No. Right, it does not pass the vertical line test, does it? <laughs> Let's try that. <clears throat> Let's find a better point. Let's say 5 over, I'll do 6 over. 6 over and 3 up. So roughly speaking here. So 6 comma 3. And then I'm going to, my example is going to be just connect the dots. So this function, y equals f of x, this is called piecewise linear. It's a piecewise linear. That's what this kind of thing is called because it's, it's made in pieces and the pieces are linear, right? And um, okay, great. How about this function? Is it, uh, is it one to one? Does it pass the horizontal line test? Is there just one output? If, if we look at a, a given output which is attained, is it only attained by one input? Well, yeah. All right, so then <clears throat> if we follow this, um, you know, how we make the graph comment, we're going to take the point, um, and I'm going to do the inverse graph, and well, maybe I got, an or I got an orange over here. Orange shows up a little bit better. So how about this, this 3 minus 2 flips to what? Minus 2 and then 3. So that flips over here like that. Um, minus 2, 
3, that's this point. On the, that point transforms to that point for the inverse. And here, I flip the 3, 6, right? What happens to the point uh, minus 3, 3 if we flip the... It's the same, right? Yeah, so the inverse function then, connect the dots. By the way, there's a theorem. The inverse of a piecewise linear function, if it is invertible, is again a piecewise linear function. But of course, you can see that here. The inverse function, which I've made orange, is again a piecewise linear function. And so if you're given the graph of a function, you can create the graph of the inverse by just flipping the x and y component, x and y coordinates to the graph to make your new function. And um, like people have a, a thing they say about this, they say that the new graph is obtained, the graph of the inverse is obtained from the graph, the given graph by reflection across the line y equals x. So graph of y equals f inverse of x is obtained by um, reflecting y equals f of x across y equals x, which I'll make blue. Let me try that better. I don't know, this really, it's almost imperce imperceivable if you watch the video. I mean, it's really hard to see that blue. I'm sorry about that. Yeah. You know what I need to do? Oh, yeah? That's funny. I, I need to go get some of that sidewalk chalk at, like, Walmart, and I'll start using that for my other colors. But it's kind of scratchy. I don't want to scratch the board either, you know? So there's an example. There's other games you can, so I have a homework problem where um, I give you like half of a function, I tell you the function's even, say create the other half, right? Another one, I give you half of the function, I say the function's odd, create the other half of the function, so um, these are kind of fun. I give you half of a graph, or I give you the graph of a function, you can create the graph of the inverse function or complete the graph of the function using even or odd like, um, The even problem I'm talking about, for example, if I told you that the function's even, you know, and, and this was the graph y equals f of x, right? If I tell you f is even, then how would you finish the graph? So this is just a, this is a digression from the current lecture, but I'm helping you with your homework for a minute. I hope you don't mind. If I tell you f is even, right, can you tell me what the graph looks like? If I, if I give you this much, right, how would you create the rest of the graph? <clears throat> What's the key equation for the graph? An even function is what? f of x equals to f of minus x, right? And so what that says in terms of the graph, that says that xy is there only if you also have minus x comma y. So any point in the positive must be reflected to a corresponding point in the negative x, and it's got the same y value, right? So you just mirror that picture across the y-axis. That's how, I mean, that's what it looks like. So like the answer would be up to the limits of my artistry, something like, like that. And I think in your homework, I gave you graph paper, right? So you, don't have, you can be more, you can do better than I did here. Kind of, ske kind of sketchy. Oh, yeah. If, if f was odd, then the, the equation is what? f of, um, you know, f of minus x equals to minus f of x or something like that. So that would say that, well, let's see here. Let me put the minuses all on one side. Golly, come on. 
worked myself into a corner here. Um, f of x equals to minus f of minus x. You could write it that way. <clears throat> and so basically x, y gets paired with what? Minus x, minus y. So instead of for every point x, y, I have the corresponding point minus x, minus y. So it, yeah, it flips. We say it reflects through the origin. So like this point goes to that point, and um, it's roughly that. I, 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 I'm, you know, doing the best I can here freehand in it, but it's something like that. If if we were told that f was odd, then it would be something like that. Okay, so that's how you graph the inverse function if you're given the function. Um, let's, let's work another example. Let's let f of x equal to um, 6 minus x squared and <clears throat> oh, excuse me 6 minus um, x plus 3 squared here we go um, find f inverse of x if possible if need be Add a condition. To um, make domain of f smaller. So what's the what's the default domain if I just tell you f of x is equal to um, six minus parentheses x plus three squared? What would the with a default domain on that one, me. Which x does this formula make sense for? I have a negative infinity to positive infinity. That's right, all real numbers. So um, there's different ways of going about this. One way is if, you have, if you're very graphically, graphically minded, you could draw the graph to start with, and that would kind of tell you what happens. But the other way to do is just to do algebra. So let's do that. Let's try to do algebra, which is to go through the steps of calculating the inverse function. In the process of doing that, we're going we're gonna to discover what the problem is with finding the inverse. So what's step number one? We write y equals to the formula. Like that, right? And then step number two is to solve for x, right? Solve for x. How are we going to do that? I suggest what we do is we put x minus x plus 3 squared on the left hand side and we set that equal to 6 minus y. Did you guys see that? So I'm isolating my x variable like that. That is that okay? And then okay, so I've got something squared equals to another quantity, right? So we, how do we remove the square? We take the square root of the equation, right? But when we do that, we have to be allowing the plus and the minus, right? So this then says that x plus three is equal to plus or minus the square root, oh man, 6 minus y. And you see, we got a problem, right? Because we have the plus or the minus. 
And that means that as, when I solve for x, I'm not going to get just one value. I'm going to get two, one for the plus, one for the minus, right? And so that's not going to work for a function, right? A function has to be single valued. So it looks like unless we, you know, attach some strings, so to speak, it's, it's, it's double valued, right? So that means x is not a function of y unless I do what? What condition would I need to put in order to just choose the plus, for example? What condition would I need to put to just choose the minus? Let's think about it, right? So if I want to, if, mm -hmm. what's that? Y is greater than 6. Why is greater than 6? Um, I think Y has to be less than 6. But, or equal to 6. I think 6 is like the biggest Y could be. But we, we, need, we need a condition for X though, because we want to limit the domain of the function. I mean, you're not wrong. But try to come up with a condition for x. Same idea for x. How about um, if uh, case one, what if we had x plus 3 greater than or equal to 0, right? If you knew that, if x plus 3 was greater than or equal to 0, that would force us to choose the plus solution, right? Then x equals to minus 3 plus the square root of 6 minus y. And that would be the formula for f inverse of, of y. What, what, what would that, I mean, in other words, we're saying the domain of f is what? Like what, minus 3 included out to infinity? Yeah. X greater than or equal to minus 3. And then the, the other kind of natural choice, if you want to cut down the domain, would be to suppose X plus 3 is less than or equal to 0, because then the algebra we just went through would give us X equals to minus 3 minus the square root of 6 minus Y. And that would be my inverse function. And then, in other words, the domain of f in my case 2, I'm saying minus infinity to minus 3. Then, then this would be the formula for the inverse function. So graphically, what's going on here is we've got a parabola. What, this is what? This is a parabola. If we put y equals to 6 minus x plus 3 squared, you can look at that as taking the, the y equals x squared graph, flipping it over so it's going down, shifting it 3 to the left by adding 3, and then shifting it 6 upwards. So like the vertex is at, um, you know, minus 3, um, 6, like here. And um, so like case 1, we're saying x is greater than minus 3. So like, what's the y-intercept for this? Put x equal to 0, what do you get? No, put x equal to 0, what's f of, what's f of 0 equal to? 6 minus what? 6 minus 0 plus 3 squared, right? 6 minus, 6 minus 9. So the y-intercept is actually minus 3. Mi minus 3. Because 6 minus 9, right? So, I mean, that's not quite right, but it's something like that, right? And then, like, the inverse function, if you were to graph it, if you were to graph, um, you know, 
Oh, man. Fine, I can graph it. Let's do it. That top point was what? It was minus 3, 6, right? So the inverse, the inverse function, which is this formula up here, if you replace y with x, would, would start where? It would start 6 comma minus 3, right? So it starts like down here. Um, and it would, let's see here. There's that line y equals x. We're reflecting across that, right? Um, oh, so I could also like track. Here's another point. We figured this point out, right? This point was what? 0 comma minus 3, right? So on the inverse function, the graph of the inverse function, you get what? Minus 3 comma 0, right? That y-intercept becomes an x-intercept for the inverse function. So, and um, let's see here. And let's see here. What, what else can I? What else can help me out here? What, what's the range? So what I'm trying to what I'm trying to figure out right now, guys, is how to graph y equals f inverse of x in case one, which is what it's minus three plus the square root six minus x. What's the domain of the inverse function here? What did we say at the start? It should be the range of the what? Of the function, right? What's the range of this function? Minus infinity all the way up to what? No, no, no. The range it goes, yeah, it goes all the way up to the vertex here at 6. So we expect the domain of the inverse function to be 6 to minus infinity. So this point actually is far out as far, far out as it goes. This point here, six, uh, 6 minus 3, that's basically the furthest point to the right on the graph of the inverse function. And then it, um, it's hard for me to graph it, but it's, it's something like this basically. There you go. There's y equals f inverse of x. In contrast, part two, what's going on there? I'll try to do it a little bit more kind of glibly, just quickly here. Instead of, instead of going, um, instead of looking at the right branch, you're looking at the left branch, right? And so what is the, the inverse? Again, it starts like here, right? It still starts at that same kind of like, um, right, yeah, still, it's still got that same starting point. But instead of opening up, it does what? Like, yeah, it opens down like that. So if I, if I could draw this one over here, it would just be like making this into a parabola. Here? So case two, we're assuming that we're taking the domain of the function and just making it less than minus 3. So that's our assumption. Case 2 is, like, case 2 is making the domain of f minus infinity. Oh, man, I can't write that there. Minus infinity to minus 3. This chalk is worthless. Okay, so case 1 would have been making it. Um... Minus 3 to infinity. So either, either looking... We can either look at the left branch or the right branch of the parabola. If we, if we like, take our given function and 
just choose that side or that side. Those separate pieces respectively will solve, you know, will be injective. They'll pass the horizontal line test and we can find the inverse. But we can't find an inverse function for the whole parabola because it fails the, fails the horizontal line test, right? Which we discovered in our algebra by finding that plus minus solution. So, so uh, this is a challenge problem, right? If, like this is kind of the hardest question I can ask on the next, to next test is something along the lines of here's a formula you know, find for me a way to make the domain smaller such that you can invert the function. That, I think that's a pretty challenging question for your class, right? Um, so usually I kind of take that difficulty away from you and say, here's a function, I already make the domain small enough so that it's injective, so it's one to one, and then you find the inverse, right? Through this solve for x process that I've described. Now, the other thing to watch out for is if you're graphing, you notice that if you're graphing both the function and the inverse function, there's an extra, st extra step in my process that's needed because we want y equals f inverse of x, right? So I have to take this formula and replace y with x in order to actually do the graph, you know? So there's, that's something to watch out for. Let me uh, finish class today with a word problem, which I hope will convince you why I use the... Um, the language I do. So this is a, I think this is a good example because it's, it's a real, real world example and the algebra is not super complicated and it affects our life. Um, so the problem is Celsius versus Fahrenheit. So what's the relation between degrees Celsius and degrees Fahrenheit. Well, here it is. F is equal to 9 fifths C plus 32. Right? So that is degrees Fahrenheit as a function of degrees Celsius. Right? For, for example, um, so you could, you could say that this is like G of C, you know? So I'm, I'm saying G is the function, you know? And I'm, I'm just letting it equal to F because F is Fahrenheit, you know? So G is a function of degree Celsius. And there it is. It's a linear function. It has slope 9 fifths. It has Y intercept 32. What is G of 0? What is G of 100? G of 0, 32. G of 100, 9 fifths of 100 plus 32, which is, by the way, 180 plus 32, which is 212. So you might recognize 32 degrees as the temperature of water freezing, you know, whereas 100 degrees Celsius is the temperature of water boiling, right, usual terms and conditions. And correspondingly, in Fahrenheit, you got 32 degrees versus 212 degrees, right? So to find the inverse, how do we find G inverse? So go up here. We set F equal to 9 fifths C plus 32, and we want to solve for C. That's all you got to do. Solve for C. What do we get? We get F minus 32 equals to 9 fifths C. So multiply that by 5 ninths. What do we get? Five ninths times F minus 32. There you go. That's G inverse of F. So for example, if you plug in 32 degrees Fahrenheit, what is G inverse of 32 equal to? If you use this formula, 32 minus 32 is 0. So G inverse of 0 is, I mean, rather G inverse of 32 is 0, right, which makes sense, right? And if you were to calculate 
inverse of 212, you would get 100. Now, what would happen if you tried to graph both of these equations on the same graph? Do you see, the, do you see a problem with doing that conceptually? The problem with doing that conceptually is that the graph for the original function has an x coordinate, which means Celsius. Whereas if you were to graph the inverse function on that same graph in the way we've been doing these, your x would have to mean Fahrenheit. And you can't have both scales at once on the same graph. So I mean, I think that's where we get into trouble sometimes with applications by using the same letter for both the variable and like for two different variables, right? Like Celsius and Fahrenheit, these are different things. So it's good to be able to talk about a function of f and then be able to talk about a different function of c. Right? We don't have to always use x for the variable because sometimes what we want to call x has different meanings. That's the, that's the point. One, one final thought. Um, is there any time, or rather, is there any temperature where the degrees Fahrenheit and the degrees Celsius are equal. Did you guys know that? There's a, there's a particular temperature where people who read thermometers with Celsius and people who read thermometers with Fahrenheit, they get the same reading. Did you know that? If you want to find it algebraically, think about it. What you're saying is F equals to C, right? So just pick your favorite equation up here. I'll take this one. Yeah, negative 40. So f is equal to 9 fifths f plus 32. And if you solve this equation, that gives you minus 4 fifths f equals to 32, which gives us f is equal to 32 times 5 divided by 4 with a minus, which, by the way, is minus 40, like you just told me. Now, did you just remember that? Or is that through the power of the Google? What's that? You've heard it before. Oh, that's good. That's good. So, it's kind of fun. Anyway, enjoy your weekend. I told you I was going to try to end early.